Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Harberson. I'm America's college counselor. It's good to be back here on another Facebook Live for the month of February. This is a very busy time for those high school seniors who are awaiting regular decision results, but also plenty of high school freshmen, sophomores, and juniors who have questions about course selection, test optional colleges, whether or not you should be visiting colleges at this point, and what to be doing this summer, and a whole host of other questions that I hope to answer for all of you. If you are joining me, you can let me know where you're coming from, what state, what country, if you are a parent or a student, what year of high school the student is in. It's always interesting to see what cross-section of the population, the college-bound population we have for these Facebook Lives. I do them every single month and we save them so you can always check out a previous Facebook Live. This is where families can ask any college admissions questions they want and I try to answer as many as I can. So why don't we get started with um, our first question because they are already coming in. Uh, thank you for all you do. Our daughter has to make the choice between crew, which involves a time commitment of four hours per day, but will have a leadership position versus the opportunity to volunteer in an after school program, which aligns with her neuroscience interest as well as her passion project. Also, she will be doing clinical neuroscience research this summer. She can't do both after school activities. Oh, that's such a bummer. Which should she choose? Will the colleges hold it against her if she quits crew or should she do crew as she will have a summer full of neuroscience? This is such a tough call. You know, the, the truth of the matter is when a student is applying to college, um, they can list, if they're using the Common App, up to 10 activities. And there's usually a little bit of variety that goes on. A student could play a sport. Sometimes students don't play sports, but they do the performing arts or the fine arts. Um, but I always say when a student has an idea about what they want to major in, I like for them to try to pursue that in an extracurricular activity so that they can list it on their application on their activities list. And this will allow them to provide evidence of their major choice. So to me, I want her to still be able to do crew if she enjoys it and if she's gonna be captain of the crew team by senior year. And if she's able to do that neuroscience research in the summer, to me, that would be a nice balance because you kinda of wanna have a little bit of both on your activities list. Next question. Hi, Sarah. Love all your admissions expertise. We're members of AN 2023, but this question is for our younger daughter. She is a freshman and currently deciding on classes for next year. She is in all honors, she is in all honors classes with a 4.0 GPA. She attends a Catholic school, so religion class takes up one period. Her career interest is computer science, so she plans on taking AP computer science next year. She took band this year and really enjoys it and wants to take it again sophomore year as well, which doesn't leave time for a history class. Should we have her drop band for an honors history class or take a history class over the summer um, at our community college? The high school will not include the community college history class on her high school transcript and consequently her grade won't factor into the GPA. So here's a couple things, um, and this family is part of Application Nation, so they know my 5-4 plan, which represents or encourages students to try to take all five core subjects for all four years. History is a core subject. However, if a student is not able to take a history class their sophomore year because they're taking, let's say, AP Computer Science because they want to major in Computer Science, I, I think that is probably acceptable and a very manageable option and realistic option for them. Um, I don't think the fact that she wouldn't have history sophomore year, I don't think that would hold her against 
uh, hold uh, it again it wouldn't be held against her in the college admissions process and that's the thing if you're interested in computer science and your high school offers AP computer science principles and AP computer science a I would encourage the student to be able to take both of those classes before senior year that way you have a final year grade in both of those classes and possibly even an AP score as well so I wouldn't want her to drop band if that's what she enjoys let's try to figure out a way where she can squeeze in AP computer science but I would just make sure that she has taken history in ninth grade and plans to take it in 11th and 12th grade at her high school. That way she wouldn't have to take a community college class in history over the summer or during the school year. For other core subjects, especially for English and math, I do really want to make sure that students have those classes through senior year because those are one of the those are two core classes that are expected to be seen on every student's schedule 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th grade. Next question, can you talk about how accepted students should reject offers, acceptances from schools that they are not planning on attending? This is a great question because there is this whole ethical, ethical dilemma that students will go through. If they've been admitted to a college or university and they know that they are not planning to enroll because they've already been admitted to other institutions, um, that they would prefer to go instead. It is their responsibility to notify that college that accepted them that they are no long that they are not going to be accepting that offer um, and they're going to be enrolling elsewhere. It's a very easy thing for students to do. Usually you can do it right on the college admissions portal or sometimes there is an option to email the admissions office as well. It's important to do that if you know where you're going or you're not planning to enroll at that institution you have other offers because that can offer up a spot for another student who has applied or who is on the wait list so there is that ethical responsibility to notify all the colleges whether or not you're going to be enrolling for all the colleges that accepted you Next question, if a super elite college sent a random letter to my son saying that he would be a good fit based on test scores, is that from the PSAT score? I bet everyone gets these though. So all of these colleges, whether they need more applications or not, yes, they're gonna target students who are on their mailing list or that they've bought names from the college board, for example, through the PSAT. So when the student fills out the information for the PSAT, that can trigger colleges being able to buy that student's information or at least some basic demographic information about the student, like where they're from and their GPA and obviously their PSAT scores and maybe their major choice. And that will begin to generate communication to the student. So. You know, that is based on PSAT score, and we know that PSAT scores are different than ACT and SAT scores. We also know that a lot of colleges are test optional, and we know that colleges and universities, for the most part, are looking at a lot of pieces in the application. But so if a college reaches out to you, what does it mean? It usually means that they bought your name um, from one of the testing organizations and you just want to make sure that you're putting together together a thoughtful list. So if the student is highly competitive for that college and they're really interested, obviously they can apply, but we wouldn't want to build a college list just with highly selective elite colleges anyway. Next question, hi, how much do SATs matter these days? My daughter did well on the SATs, but she worries that it won't matter as so many schools go test optional. At these test optional schools, do high SAT scores still help as much as they used to, or are schools relying more on other factors, even for kids who submit their scores? I get this question a lot, and I think it's a really important one because test optional colleges can be really helpful for students who haven't been able to take a test or aren't happy with their test scores or don't feel like they are as strong as some other pieces of the application. But test optional colleges are great for students 
who've done extremely well on the SAT or ACT. If a college has a test optional policy, not a test blind policy like the UCs or a couple of other schools in the country, but if they have a test optional policy, it doesn't mean that they don't care about those high test scores. In fact, they care deeply about it. You will find that for colleges that go test optional, you will see an uptick in the average SAT and ACT scores for their admitted pool of students. So they want those high test scores. Is a high test score a reason why a highly selective college would admit a student? Probably not, but it would keep the student highly competitive in that applicant pool. But for a college that has a higher acceptance rate, for a college that offers merit scholarships, those high test scores are definitely going to help in the admissions process. And again, they would help at a highly selective college, um, but usually test scores is not gonna be the silver bullet of why a student gets admitted to a highly selective college. So if you are a good test taker, make sure you are reporting those scores when you apply to those test optional colleges because they care deeply and they wanna brag that their SAT and ACT scores are as high as ever even in this test optional landscape. Next question, any tips on how and when to appeal or negotiate merit scholarships? What about need-based aid? We just covered this question actually in my Application Nation Class of 2022 group as well. So what I told them is that there are two paths. If you are appealing your need-based financial aid, usually the parents do that or the custodians because they've filled out the financial aid paperwork and they can go straight to the financial aid office. If it is a student trying to appeal for merit scholarships or more merit money, the student would be directing their appeal to the admissions office. So there are two different paths. How do you do it? For both pathways, I recommend that the family or if it's the student appealing for more merit money should write an email or a formal letter, provide any updates, and also provide any better offers that they got from other institutions that are true competitors for that college or university. That's how a student has more leverage in this process. When the college that you're trying to get more money out of sees the actual offer, and yes, you should be including the actual offer from an institution that they see as a peer or a competitor or a big overlapping institution. When should you be doing this? You technically can start as early as when you get an acceptance letter and you get your financial aid package or you get your merit scholarship. But I can tell you that as we get closer to May 1st, if you've been admitted to, under a rolling admissions process, an early action round or regular decision, the closer you get to May 1st, the more pressure there is on a college or university. I'm not saying that every college or university is going to be willing to look at your uh, materials again. I'm not saying that every college will increase your need-based aid or it will increase your merit scholarship award, but if they see that you are getting better offers from their competitors and it's close to May 1st, you usually are gonna have a little bit more success than if you do it, let's say, right now. Because like, a lot can happen between now and May 1st when those enrollment deposits are due. And as we get closer to May 1st, the college or university is gonna be able to see how their enrollment deposits are stacking up. If they're tracking behind, They'll, they will have even more pressure on them to try to at least come in line with another institution's package. Next question, thinking of moving to Virginia for senior year, I assume senior year of high school, currently doing all APs in an online school we switched to in the fall. Is this all going to work against her? How to cement those recommendation letters? Also, is there a negative rep for online schools? Looking at top tier pre-med undergrad programs. Okay, there's a lot of questions in here. So let's take it from the bottom. Is there a negative stigma or reputation for online schools? Not really, not anymore, but I'm going to be honest. When I first started in this business 20 plus years ago, 
students who were homeschooled, there weren't that many home online options, but as the years went on in, in my profession that I was in that field, I, there were more online schools popping up. And there was a bit of a negative stigma, an unfair one, if, if I, you know, in my opinion. But over the years, it's become a lot more common. And now with the pandemic, there are a lot of families who have chosen to do online because it's easier in um, the pandemic and within their family circumstances. So I don't think the stigma is there anymore. Now, for a student who is switching high schools, whether they're going from one public high school to another, um, they're going from a private school to a public school, a public school to a private school, an online school to another type of high school, it's really tough to transfer in high schools, no matter what year it is. I think it's especially tough for a student to try to transfer in for senior year. But obviously, if there is no other option and that is the best environment for the student, absolutely, I would do that for my kid. But you just wanna keep in mind that that school counselor isn't gonna know you, um, the students aren't gonna know you, so socially, academically, you're gonna need some time to acclimate. I would say that if you are planning to transfer, you just wanna connect with your current teachers so that you are requesting letters of recommendation before the end of the year and that you have their contact information. Because if you leave that school, you wanna be able to communicate with your letter writers if anything does come up. Would you advise a pass instead of a C in a class? or keep the C. My son received a C in Spanish during the peak of COVID slash winter 2020. He subsequently has gotten A's in the semesters that followed. This is a tough one. Um, so actually in the state of California, there was um, a rule where every single student could choose a pass fail class. Um, and that wouldn't impact their GPA or class standing. So for Californians, this was pretty common. Besides Californians, it is still pretty unusual, even in the pandemic, to see a student take a class for pass-fail. It definitely causes the admissions officer or admissions committee to ask questions. Um, I think it depends on when the C uh, when the student got the C, I think for freshman year, it's a little, there's a little bit more distance and if the student's grades have improved and if there's a clear reason like COVID or the pandemic, the student could comment in the COVID section in the application or the school counselor could mention something in the letter of recommendation. It's a really close call. Um, I would say if the C was in freshman or sophomore year and caused by COVID and there's a clear reason for it, um, I probably would still, I would keep the C because I think the pass fail does make an admissions officer worry that the grade was even lower, but it's, it's a, it's, it's a close call on this one. And I can't give you a definitive answer. I would just say that if you stick with the C, you want to make sure that there's an explanation. If you do a pass fail, I guess the school counselor could mention in the letter of recommendation, the student was doing very well, but not as well as what they typically have done, but it still kind of definitely raises some red flags. Next question. How many schools should a student who has hopes for primarily highly selective schools in mind apply for? How does a student decide which to apply to? Good question. I'm doing this exact topic um, with my Application Nation Class of 2023 group next week. Um, it is all about building the college list. I'm pretty conservative and that's because I think we need to be conservative in this environment. All of these colleges, look at all those emojis and likes. I really appreciate it on a random Wednesday night. Um, I think we have to be conservative and cautious when we're building the college list because things have changed and they continue to change. I'll give you an example. The University of Wisconsin-Madison um, is a highly respected national university. Um, their acceptance rate, gosh, I don't know what it is. I'm sure someone could share with it. It's a little bit higher in the past than you would think it than you think it would be. But this year, I'm seeing a lot of students that would have gotten in in past years not get admitted this year. So does that mean that University of Wisconsin-Madison got a whole lot more selective from last year to this year? Probably. 
but you don't know that when you're putting your college list together. So I have a whole way and approach of how I identify the type of student I'm working with and then I identify the types of colleges that should be on their list. But it is my belief that every single student, whether they are the highest achieving student, whether they are more in the middle range or whether they're a student who maybe is just taking a standard level curriculum or has a lot of uh, grades in a, in, a, in a big range, um, it doesn't matter. I want students to have reach colleges, target colleges, and likely colleges on their list. And it's my recommendation to have an equal number of each. But a reach college is not a college where you are uncompetitive for. It's my belief that even your reach colleges, you objectively are competitive for that college or university. That is the only way to ensure that you will have plenty of acceptances to choose from. But I generally recommend an equal number of reach, target, and likely colleges on the list. If you wanna figure out what type of student you are, I have reach, target, and likely students that I work with, and that covers every type of student there is. But if you're trying to figure out what type of student you are and what types of colleges should be near on your list, you definitely should consider Application Nation Class of 2023. I'll be doing my Zoom call on that topic next week. And I also do offer just to my Application Nation families that I will do college list reviews if they want. So keep that in mind. Next question. Do last semester grades still matter in senior year after the acceptances for early action or regular decision are in? So generally, first semester grades could absolutely factor in if you've applied through an early round and absolutely if you've applied in regular decision, almost all the colleges, the selective colleges, will require first semester grades from senior year before they make a decision. But what happens after you get accepted? Well, the, what happens is you will decide on one college, right? that you are sending in your enrollment deposit into. And you will do that by May 1st, let's say, if you've been admitted under a rolling admissions program, an early action program, or a regular decision program. If it was early decision, you would have already sent in your deposit. But May 1st, you send in your deposit indicating that you plan to enroll at that institution, usually in the following fall for freshman year. But what happens is that college that you sent your enrollment deposit to doesn't get your final transcript usually until sometime in June when you have already graduated from high school and your high school has finalized your final official transcript. So the admission staff goes back and reviews those final transcripts because they want to see how you've done for the second half of senior year. They also want to double check and verify, especially if there was any self-reported information on your application, like classes or grades or anything like that. They want to verify that what you put into the application matches up with your final transcript. If they see that your grades have gone down, they will reach out to you and probably ask for an explanation. The grades would have to go down pretty low and pretty significantly for your offer of admission to be in jeopardy. But just remember, by that point, it's, Ju it's June, July, you've already declined all of your other offers. So that's why it's important to continue to work hard even through the second half of senior year. Next question, do deferred applications really have any chance of getting accepted? They do. We just have to remember that in regular decision, almost always the acceptance rate goes down and it can go down significantly, especially if that college already had an early decision round, two early decision rounds, or possibly even an early action round. In my experience, um, both on the college side and the college counseling side, I would say that generally speaking, if you've been deferred, your chances of admission and regular decision are usually about the same as the students who applied regular decision. It's hard to find that data, what the acceptance rate is for 
regular decision for a college or university, usually they aren't going to make that information public, but it's usually going to drop pretty significantly in regular decision, so you want to be aware of it. If you want your best shot of being deferred, I highly recommend that you send what's called an LOCI, a letter of continued interest to that college or university if they permit it, and obviously having very strong first semester grades will definitely increase your chances of admission in regular decision. All right, next question. What should you start to worry if you haven't heard back from a school? Do you assume that you're not accepted or do you reach out to admissions and find out the status of your application? Also, can you put a deposit on two schools if you are really undecided by May 1st? So if you've applied to a rolling admissions program, usually those colleges will notify you sometimes depending on when it is if it's at the very beginning of the school year sometimes they notify students within a couple of weeks but as the year goes on more applications come in and you will find that it takes them longer for a decision to be released to you sometimes it can be several weeks sometimes it can be several months but for any other college that has specific deadlines like early decision early action or regular decision they usually have a specific date when they release all of their decisions and they usually do it on that day. If you know what that day is or that date is and you haven't heard, you should reach out to the admissions office. Sometimes something got missed um, and so you'd want to make sure that you are asking the question about if everybody heard back at this point. Um, so I would definitely follow up with the admissions office and the student should do that, not the parents. And then you asked about what we call double depositing. It's actually not permitted. And if you read the fine print when you apply to these colleges and it's on Common App, you're actually, you check off a box or you sign your name indicating that you will not do that. So it's, it's not right, it's not ethical to double deposit at two schools. What a lot of students don't realize is giving yourself extra time to make a decision and sending in multiple deposits usually doesn't help the situation. So it is my experience after working with students for over 20 years that buying extra time, getting an extension, usually makes things worse. So really stick to that May 1st deadline, pick one college, and, um, and I think stick with it. Next question. AP Calculus BC or AP Statistics? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I just did, um, I just recorded a video on this exact topic. Okay, a lot of things to keep in mind. Let's do a little history lesson though. Let's walk back to over the last 20, 30 years. I would say if you were applying to highly selective colleges, AP Calculus was the expected class that a student should take by senior year, regardless of their major choice, whether it was STEM or non-STEM, that was the expectation. And if you were able to take AP Calculus BC, even better. Um, AP Statistics is a great class that can be taken after you've taken AP Calculus AB or even AP Calculus BC. Sometimes that could be the last math class offered. Should AP Statistics be taken in place of calculus? I think if you're applying to highly selected colleges, still to this day, I think things are beginning to change a little bit because there are some reports out there. There was an article that was just published this week, I think in Inside Higher Education about this exact topic that's basically challenging the idea about highly selected colleges expecting calculus. But I think if you wanna play it safe, you want to make sure that you have at least calculus um, under your belt if you're applying to highly selected colleges and especially if you're applying to those STEM fields. AP Calculus BC is highly regarded. I would say it's respected more than AP Statistics, but if that's the last class you have to take at your high school, you definitely can take it for senior year. If I want to drop honors multivariable calculus in my second senior semester because I missed two weeks of school due to COVID-19. Will this become a problem for a few colleges, U Michigan, Harvard, Penn, that I'm waiting for decisions? So whenever a student changes their schedule, either adds a class or drops a class, 
um, from when they or what from what they originally listed on their application it is their responsibility to notify all of the colleges not only the colleges that have already admitted them but the colleges that they are awaiting decisions Dropping a core class like multivariable calculus is not something that admissions officers like to hear. But if there's a really good reason, because you had COVID and you missed a significant amount of time, you were very sick, to me that's probably a strong reason and a thoughtful reason. So if uh, when you are notifying those colleges to let them know that your schedule has changed, that you had to drop that class, make sure you explain because I think any human being would understand that if you miss two weeks of multivariable calculus that can really put you behind the eight ball multivariable cal multivariable calculus is a highly respected class it is usually taken after ap calculus bc so i i would understand even though i didn't take that class in high school that if i missed two weeks that that would really um impact my performance in the class. So I think it's an understand, it's a very understandable thing. Um, but you'd want to provide that explanation and notify all those colleges and you'd want to do that now if you haven't already. Next question, my child who's a junior had one rough semester when the school went fully remote during the pandemic fall of 2021. However, has straight A's all other semesters. Should this be covered by the student or let it be? References you made a COVID you mentioned a COVID section, do colleges take that into consideration? You know what's so, such a reality check that I'm hearing about students struggling in their classes multiple times every single day. Um, not only for students who've had COVID or a student um, who has a family member who has been impacted by COVID, but even just students who are impacted by this pandemic, they, um, they are finding it a lot tougher um, to do well in their classes for a variety of reasons, because of virtual school, because of inconsistency with teaching, because of content, because of masks, there are so many reasons. So this is a lot more common. So I would say if there is a COVID related reason for those lower grades, I do really think it's important to provide an explanation in the COVID section of the application. And Common App has a COVID section. Uh, the coalition application has a COVID section. Really every college has a COVID section at this point. So you can provide an explanation. And I think that's really important. Will colleges be, be understanding? I hope they will. I really do. And I, I think this is an important moment in the college admissions um, environment and landscape where colleges are saying they're gonna be understanding, but they really have to not only talk the talk, they have to walk the walk. And that means that they need to be admitting students who may have had a rough patch, but for those students who were able to improve their grades after that, I think they're gonna have um, the best luck and the best chance of admission um, when that happens. Next question, do colleges really cap how many students they will accept per high school? Are the kids in competition with their own classmates? Two great questions. Most colleges will say that they have no quotas or caps on the number of students that they will admit from a high school, but they absolutely will look at what they've done in the past as a guidepost. It doesn't mean that they will do the exact same thing every year because they have to respond to the quality that they see in that particular admission cycle. So sometimes as an admissions officer, as an associate dean, as a dean of admissions, I would see a high school send an incredible group of applicants and we would respond with more acceptances. And then the next year, we might not get um, the same type of quality from that high school. So every year is different. But are students competing against their classmates at their high school? Yes, to some extent. The admissions officer is trained to look at a student's application and look at what they've taken advantage of at their high school. And if there are students taking a more rigorous curriculum, for example, or have higher grades, or have um, bigger impact or bigger leadership roles, yes, they will look at that and compare students from the same high school. So that's really the 
the first comparison that happens. Um, and then the admissions officer or the admissions committee is also looking to see how that student compares within a region and, and even the entire applicant pool, but it first starts within the high school environment. So that's why I say it's not about what high school you go to, it's about what you take advantage at your high school. How do I understand your 5-4 plan? I have just joined your page. Okay, so every single week, Artie, I, or almost every single week of the year, I write a blog. My most popular blog that I've ever written was about my 5-4 plan. You can five, find my 5-4 plan blog on sarahharberson.com. Go at the top. There's a link for all of my blogs. Again, I write about 50 a year, so there are a lot. No matter what question you have on the admissions process, I probably have written a blog about it. So it just shows you that there are a lot of free resources right on my site. If you want more help in picking the classes for next year, you might want to consider joining Application Nation just because right now we are doing this on our private discussion board on a regular basis and I'm also doing private course selection reviews as well. So if you want more support there, we just posted um, all the blogs that I have and you'll be able to click on that. But if you want more information, check out the blogs first, see if that is helpful. But obviously if you have more specific questions, I would encourage you to, to consider joining Application Nation. Next question. On average, how much time is spent reviewing an application, including reading the essay? Yeah. So you all know me, I like to tell it like it is. I like to tell it to you straight. And things have changed dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years. When I was an entry level admissions officer at the University of Pennsylvania, I was supposed to, I was supposed to read an application in about 20 minutes, but a lot of times it took me longer to do that. But I only had to read about 25 applications a day during the reading season. We know that in 2022, most admissions officers do not have 20 to 30 minutes to read an application. Um, there are sometimes twice, three times, four times as many applicants applying to that institution than there were when I first started. And the acceptance rate is a lot lower. And so admissions officers needed to speed things up. And so there was an article that was in the Chronicle of Higher Education several years ago. It was before I wrote my book and really was kind of the catalyst for me writing Soundbite. And in the Chronicle of Higher Education article, it said and shared that a number of institutions, including Penn, was reading an application in about four minutes. That is not a lot of time. Admissions officers are speed readers, so they can go through letters of recommendation and essays pretty quickly, but the piece of the application that often takes the most time is gonna be the high school transcript. Now granted, and I don't know if Penn is still doing this, but at the time of the Chronicle of Higher Education article, they were saying they were splitting the application into two. So one admissions officer would read kind of the objective pieces of the application and another admissions officer would read the subjective pieces of the application and come together to make an admissions decision. But still, four minutes um, each it, among two admissions officers is not a lot of time. That is why, everyone, drum roll please, that is why it is so important for a student to have a very powerful, succinct, and distinctive soundbite. I wrote an entire book about it. Because if you don't have a powerful, succinct, and distinctive soundbite, I can tell you right now, admissions officers are gonna come up with a soundbite for you. When they read your application and they are recommending an admissions decision, an acceptance, a deny, or a wait list, they can't just say, I want to admit the student or I wanna deny the student. They have to come up with a reason. And a lot of times they will come up with a one sentence statement, just like the soundbite for the student. And you want that soundbite that the admissions officer writes about your application to be as powerful as your own soundbite that you have for yourself. 
So I would encourage you to check out my book, Soundbite. It is truly the secret that will get you into the colleges you want to get admitted to. It is truly the secret that will help you get through every stage of your life. So check that out. On that note, if you want more information about Soundbite, about my blogs, about Application Nation, go to sarahharberson.com and check back here. I always do a Facebook Live every single month. I also do an Instagram Live every single month. So a lot of free options for those families. And I've heard from a lot of you that following my advice can really help you get into the college of your dreams. Obviously though, if you want more information, more guidance, Application Nation might be the group that you want to join. Oh, thanks, Jane, for that compliment on the book. I really appreciate it. And I hope you all have a great night and look forward to seeing you back here again next month. Take care. Bye-bye.